Welcome to this edition of Theological Journals, Part 2. Let us pray. Lighten our darkness, O Lord, that we may live aright in godly lives that bring glory to you and bring others to the friendship we have with you. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. We're now in Fundamentals of the Faith, Volume 1. And... The professor has been talking about the destructive views of the critics. Nothing new in these new views. Moreover, these critics claim for their peculiar views that they are a new theology and the latest investigation, but that is also untrue. Even in the times of Christ, the famous Rabbi Hillel and his disciple Gamaliel substituted for the Mosaic Law all manner of traditions, Matthew 5, 15, 2 through 9, 23, 16 to 22. Since then, other learned rabbis, such as Ben Akiba, Maimonides, and others, have engaged in biblical criticism, not only casting doubts upon the genuineness of various books of the Old Testament, but also denying the miracles and talking learnedly about the myths. Even 1800 years ago, Celsus brought forward the same objections that are now raised by modern criticism. And in his weak and bungling production, The Life of Jesus, D David Strauss has in part repeated them. And there have been other noted heretics, such as Arius, 317 AD, who denied the divinity of Christ and Pelagius in the 5th century, who rejected the doctrine of sin. Indeed, this exceedingly new theology adopts even the unbelief of those old Sadducees who said, <coughs> there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, Acts 23, 8. <coughs> and who Christ reproved with the words, you do err, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God, Matthew 22, 29. It certainly does not argue for the spiritual progress of our race, that such a threadbare and outworn, unbelieving kind of science should again in these days deceive and even stultify people. No agreement among the critics. Do these critics then, to ask the least of them, agree with one another? Far from it. To be sure, they unanimously deny the inspiration of the Bible, the divinity of Christ and the Holy Spirit, the fall of man and forgiveness of sins through Christ, also prophecies and miracles, the resurrection of the dead, the final judgment, heaven and hell. That when it comes to their pretendedly sure results, not any two of them affirm the same things. Their numerous publications create a flood of disputable, self-contradictory, and mutually destructive hypotheses. For example, the Jehovah of the Old Testament is made to be some heathen god, a nomadic or steppe god the weather god Yahoo, or the god of West Semitism. It was David who first introduced this divinity, and according to some authors, the peculiar worship of this god with its human sacrifices, only a continuation of Baal, Moloch worship. Of Abraham, it's sometimes affirmed that he never existed, but at other times he was a Canaanite chief dwelling at Hebron. No, he is the myth of Aurora, and Sarah Sharuta is the wife of the moon god Sin, and so on. The twelve sons of Jacob are very probably the twelve months of the year. As to Moses, some teach that there never was such a man. Also that the Ten Commandments were composed in the time of Manasseh. No. The more moderate writers say that Moses is a historical figure. It was in Midian that he learned about Yah, 
the tribal god of the Kenites, and he determined with this divinity to liberate his people. Elijah is simply a myth, or he was some unfortunate prop prophet who had perhaps been struck by lightning. And so, too, this modern criticism knows for sure that it was not Solomon, but wholly an unknown king living after the time of Ezra, who wrote Ecclesiastes. Also, there was never a Daniel, but that again, some unknown author wrote the book bearing his name. Moreover, Couch tells us that his this book first made its appearance in January 164, while other critics are positive that it was 165. Query, why could that not that unknown author have been Daniel? We'll pick that up in our next edition. Turn to fundamentals in the faith of volume two, which is Dr. James Gray, Reformed Episcopal clergyman, writing on the inspiration of the Old and New Testament. We've already seen Jesus in Matthew 4 overcoming the tempter in the wilderness by quotations from Deuteronomy without note or comment. It is written, referring to which Adolf Monod says, I know of nothing in the whole history of humanity nor even in the field of divine revelation, which proves more clearly than this, the inspiration of the scriptures. What? Jesus Christ, the Lord of heaven and earth, calling to his aid in that most solemn moment, Moses, his servant. He who speaks from heaven, fortifying himself against the temptations of hell by the word of him who spake from earth, how can we explain that scriptural mystery, that wonderful reversing of the order of things? If for God, the, Jesus, the words of Moses were not the words of God rather than those of men. How shall we explain it if Jesus were not fully aware that holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost? I do not forget the objections which have been raised against the inspiration of scriptures or the real obscurity with which that inspiration is surrounded. If they sometimes trouble your hearts, they have troubled mine also. But at such times, in order to revive my faith, I have only to glance at Jesus, glorifying the scriptures in the wilderness. And I have seen that for all who rely on him, the most embarrassing of proverbs, problems is transformed into historical fact, helpable and clear. Jesus, no doubt aware of the difficulties connected with the inspiration of scriptures, but did this prevent him from appealing to their testimony with unreserved confidence, led that which was sufficient for him, let that which was sufficient for him be sufficient for you. Fear not that the rock which sustained the Lord in the hour of temptation and distress will give way because you lean too heavenly. Fear not that you could lean too heavily upon God's word. In the third place, Christ teaches that scriptures are inspired as to their words. In the Sermon on the Mount, he said, Think not that I am come to destroy the law and the prophets. I'm not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Here is testimony confirmed by an oath, for verily on the lips of the Son of Man carries significant force. He affirms the indestructibility of the law, not its substance merely, but its form, not just the thought, but the word that carries the thought. Nice piece by Dr. James Gray. We turn now to volume three by 
the Baptist professor on the origin of sin in St. Paul's writings. Very, very nice article. Relation of the law to sin. Does the law produce sin? Is the law sinful in that it causes men to sin? Not at all, asserts Paul. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Albeit I had not known sin except through the law. For I had not known coveting except the law said thou shalt not covet. But sin finding occasion wrought in me through the commandment all manner of sin. For apart from the law, sin is dead. The following points seem clearly to be expressed in the passage. The law is not the real cause of man's sin. Not even its severest demands can be charged with causing man's sin. Two, this is true because the law is essentially holy, righteous, good. Holy in the double sense of being a separate order of being and conduct, ordained by God and also requiring holiness, or the following of the separate order of being righteous in the sense of being the expression of God's will and the standard of man's thoughts and actions. Good in the sense that it is ordained for benevolent ends. It's also called spiritual in the sense that it was given through God's spirit and conduces to spirituality if obeyed from the right mo motive. Number three, but this holy, righteous, good and spiritual law became the occasion of sinning. This Paul illustrates with the Tenth Commandment. You would not have coveted if the law had not said, Thou shalt not covet. The Greek word for occasion, a forming, means literally a base of operations. The sin principle makes the command of God its headquarters for a lifelong campaign of struggle in man urging him to evil actions and deterring him from good ones. There is something in man which revolts from doing that which is demanded and inclines him to do that which is forbidden. Hence the sin principle using this tendency in man and so making the law the base of its operation becomes the occasion to sinning pick that up in our next edition as we turn to Fundamentals in the Faith, Volume 4, an article by attorney Philip Morrow on the degeneration in American Academy. A warning. It is not difficult for one who has come to the knowledge of truth through receiving the word of God, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, 1 Timothy 2.13, to perceive the folly and futility of all this, but who shall deliver the ignorant, the innocent, and the unwary from being victimized and eternally despoiled by these men who, professing themselves to be wise, became fools. We can but sound the alarm and give warning especially to those who are responsible for bringing up children, of the dangers which infect the intellectualist atmosphere of universities, college, and seminaries. In closing, where are we here? We may, prof we may with profit to our readers point out a profound reason why the enemy of Christ and the men whom he seeks to save should be desirous of impressing upon the minds of the latter the conception of pantheism. That doctrine wholly excludes the idea that man is a sinner and hence puts redemption outside the pale of discussion. Under the influence of that doctrine, men would never discover his corrupt nature and need of salvation. And hence, if not delivered from it, he die, would die in his sins. An enemy of man could devise against him no greater mischief than this. God maligned 
but the doctrine which the philosophy of our day has imported from India works not only to the destruction of men, but also dishonor to God. Herein may its satanic character be clearly perceived by all who have eyes to see. Its foundation principle is that God and man are truly one in substance and being, and that the character of God is revealed in the history of humanity. This evil doctrine makes God the partner with man in all the manifold and grievous wickednesses of humankind. It makes him participate, partici part, particeps criminus in all the monstrous crimes, cruelties, uncleanness, and unnameable abominations that have stained the record of humanity. It makes him really the prime actor in all sins and wickednesses, since the thoughts and impulses prompting them originate with him. Thus God is charged with all the evil deeds which the Bible denounces, and against which the wrath of God in the Bible is declared. We move on from this that wonderful article to Dr. Michael Reeves talking about Athanasius on the Incarnation. In this second volume of Athanasius moves from looking at the word as creator to looking at the word as redeemer. Yet while the focus has shifted from creation to redemption, the subject is the same, the word of God. The two volumes are emphatically about Jesus Christ, and understanding that helps to clear the central assertion of the second volume, that the renewal of creation has wrought by the selfsame word who made it in the beginning. However, the feel of on the incarnation is quite different from that of against the heathen. Here the dark themes of sin, evil and idolatry are driven out by the words redemption, making on the incarnation, as C.S. Lewis put it, a sappy and golden book full of buoyancy and confidence. C.S. Lewis, introduction to on the incarnation. And it's important to feel that difference, important though not hard. Athanasius's punchy rhetoric is stirring stuff. For on the carnation is characterized by an idea of happy, surprising overturning. Even the revelation of God through the word is utterly surprising. The things which they as men rule out as impossible, he plainly shows to be possible. And the things which these wiseacres laugh at as human he might, by his inherent might, declare as divine. Athanasius starts with the creation of Adam and Eve, explaining that they were created good but corruptible. Of course, they were then corrupted, one almost senses, Athanasius suggesting that it was inevitably going to happen, for God's great purpose was to unite humankind to his own incorruptibility, so giving them incorruptible life. Once they were corrupted, though, what was God to do? Athanasius is adamant that it would not be worthy of God's goodness to allow humanity to be utterly destroyed. Yet destruction was exactly what was happening to humanity while the word had called non-being into creation, through sin, humankind was slipping back to non-being. What was needed was for the word to come and recreate humanity. We turn to Princeton Theological Review and this exquisite article on Calvin's view of the atonement. Without such a mediator, our sin leaves us helplessly subject to divine wrath. Quote, when we contemplate God without a mediator, we cannot conceive of him otherwise than as angry with us. A mediator interposed between us 
makes us feel that he is pacified towards us. For Calvin, it is Christ's mediatory work that brings about salvation. This is quite independent of any metaphor one might choose to illustrate the atonement. Whether Jesus is portrayed as paying our ransom, suffering our punishment, offering himself as a blood sacrifice, fighting our enemies, or even living the exemplarist life of obedience, he is in some sense standing between God and humankind to bring about resolution between the separated parties. From Christ's role as mediator deriving primarily from his priestly office springs the notion of substitution, of Christ being or doing something in our place that we could not. This is one of Calvin's most important themes, which peppers nearly everything he has to say about redemption. Regardless of the atonement metaphor he chooses at any given point, the common thread is undoubtedly substitution, Christ in our place, taking our punishment, dying our death, paying our debt, offering our sacrifice. The theme of the gospel is divine vicariousness, Christus pro nobis, the surety of glory. The unifying principle is to be differentiated from the metaphorical model of penal substitution. Here we consider the more general notion of Christ in our place, which need not be juridical in its makeup. In fact, contrary to the suggestion that penal substitution underlies all valid atonement theories for Calvin, this unifying principle is not specifically juridical, and substitution is a more appropriate undertaking outside of the juridical setting. You seem to have contradicted yourself. Christ's identification with us and the taking of our place in the penal model, as it is traditionally expressed, requires this leap. This may explain some occasions in which Calvin mixes metaphors, temporarily abandoning the penal mode for another. He begins by equating sin with crime and God with a judge and stating that punishment is required. In the case of the example above in Romans 3, 24 and 25, Calvin only allows penal language to enter after Christ has already been established as our substitute through ransom language. God has given the price of redemption in the death of Christ, and he bids us refuge in Christ's atonement. In blood, having acquired righteousness, we may stand secure before God's judgment. We now turn to reformed faith and practice and an article by N. Gray Sutanto, Reform Seminary, Washington, D.C. What counts as biblical philosophy? Reflections from Drew Johnson's biblical philosophy. When I first encountered the title of Drew Johnson's book, my interests were piqued. Most of my research has been occupied with the Dutch neo-Calvinist tradition known for its emphasis on drawing out implications for every area of life. Philosophy, too, was no exception to this. Scripture has a leavening implication for philosophy, even though it might not be a philosophical manual per se. As such, Scripture claims should be taken as a key resource for philosophical construction and investigation. Drew Johnson thus makes a welcome contribution in showing that scripture should be taken, seri taken seriously as presenting philosophy. We can detect a philosophical style by their use of logic, rigor, 
second order reasoning and advocating such reasoning. This approach recognizes that scripture records the way in which the authors reason through revelation and hence rejects the view quite popular among philosophers today that scripture is philosophically, metaphysically, or epistemologically undetermined, underdetermined. Further, Johnson shows that philosophy should be taken rather broadly. Conclusions and principles are drawn not merely from syllogistic or linear forms of argumentation, but through narratives, poetry, law, and authority. The history of philosophy itself attests to this, from the Socratic dialogues to Voltaire's Candida and Confucius's Analects. What counts as philosophy is remarkably broad, and one should not be surprised that the Bible itself models a philosophy. Johnson's work is a masterful examination of the ways in which attentiveness to the granularity of the text showcases an advocated philosophy. I learned much from his exegetical reflections. Moreover, though, Johnson notes that the philosophical rigor of the Hebraic texts are more akin to the rigor of Hellenism than its Egyptian or Mesopotamian counterparts. One should study Hebraic philosophy on its own terms and not succumb to the temptation that it should only be taken seriously insofar as it mirrors another style. Indeed, this should also serve to reinforce the fact that Greek philosophy is not the standard by which all other traditions are measured. <coughs> The neo-Calvinistic tradition would have added a hearty agreement to all of these observations and would have echoed that theologians and philosophers alike should ensure that they develop a properly biblical theology or philosophy. However, one might detect a difference in that the neo-Calvinistic tradition, more or less, affirmed that this is exactly what theologians and philosophers throughout the broad Catholic tradition has been doing. The main difference between past Christian theologians and the Neo-Calvinists, Kuiper and Boving thought, was that the latter were more methodologically self-conscious about the task. Sure enough, some figures here and there in their judgment veered too much towards biblicism and syncretism but as a whole, church tradition has proceeded precisely as an attempt to take seriously the philosophical and theological claims of scripture. Hence, while Johnson is right that we often baptize our contemporary ideas by an appeal to scripture to our peril, such a charge cannot easily be sustained against the broad Catholic traditions of the church, which includes Augustine's critical deployment of Plotinus, Benaventura's use of Plato, or more recently, Bavinck's own use of a romantic phenomenology. One might argue that the one or the other does a better job in employing the biblical material that none can be charged with lacking a desire for a biblical philosophy. So when Johnson argues that some in Christian philosophy and theology fund their ideas primarily from the discourses of their traditions and then secondarily find scriptures that support them, one might have questions. If tradition here refers to the creedal and confessional heritage of Christianity, I wonder if Johnson misses that the tradition itself is nothing other than the history of biblical exegetical reflection. To employ tradition, then, is to stand upon the deployment of scripture's philosophic and theological resources. <clears throat> <clears throat>
we turn from that to uh, the Concordia Theological Journal uh, dealing with First Clement's letter. One of the first instances of Christological prophecy and typology in Clement's interpretation of the Old Testament is found in First Clement 12. It is something of an anomaly for Clement because he engages there in uncharacteristically allegorical interpretation of scripture. In this passage, Clement calls attention to Rahab for her faith and the example that she serves. Who faith and hospitality was Rahab the prostitute saved, exhorting his hearers to the same faith. Clement goes on, however, to describe the whole episode of Joshua 2 and concludes additionally they gave to Rahab a sign that she hang out her house something like crimson, making it manifest that through the blood of the Lord will redemption for all who believe in that in hope in God, adding, see, beloved, not only faith, but prophecy is found in the woman. This indicates that for Clement, there's a connection between the Christian life, life lived in faith and the revelation of Jesus Christ. This is not mere moralizing or identification of good examples. This indicates that for Clement, true piety consists in identifying and identifying with Jesus Christ. He sees this as much as making the case for the Old Testament saints as it should be for the Corinthian Christians to whom he writes. We'll continue this edition in our next sitting. We turn to Princeton, I'm sorry, a Protestant Reformed Theological Journal with Professor David Engelsma reviewing three or four books at the same time. And he has just taken uh, Dr. Gerald Bray to the woodshed on a couple of points. One is the odd claim by Dr. Bray that holiness is not intrinsic to God's character, which is utter heresy from a, a, a so serious that I can't believe he said it. But this is the second book reviewer who has noted that in Dr. Bray. And then he calls Dr. Carl Bard, a neoconservative. That's rubbish as well. He turns now, Dr. Engelsma, to the person of Christ, a book. It's a brilliant study of the person and natures of Christ with regard especially to the distinction of the two natures and the oneness of the person. The volume clearly explains the contemporary Christological deviations of a Christology from above and from below and the quest for the historical Jesus. Against the heretical doctrine that in the incarnation the Son of God put off his godhood in one way or another, the book explains that the incarnation was addition, not subtraction. It does justice to the mystery of the reality of the one divine person of Christ in two natures, specifically regarding Christ's willing in Gethsemane, not as I will, but as thou wilt. No doubt we are left with plenty of unknowns regarding Christological metaphysics, yet there's no logical contradiction. All there is is worship and wonder for a glorious Redeemer who meets our every need. The book takes Christian Reformed theologians to task for their rehabilitation of the canonic heresy, as though in the incarnation Christ laid aside certain divine attributes. In the volume on the church, the church in introduction, the Baptist dispensational heresy held by the author clearly and significantly appears and asserts it so. Both Allison, the author of the church, and Stephen Wellam, author of the person of Christ, 
are professors at Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. Allison does boldly declare that the foundation of the church is election. But he denies that Jewish believers are part of the church. His dispensational false doctrine compels him to deny that the temple of God at the end will include saved Jews. Christians are the temple, the Jews are not. Quote, this metaphor of the temple of the Holy Spirit applies only to Christians who constitute the new covenant church. That is, it does not apply to the old covenant people of Israel. Close quote. This exclusion of Jewish believers from the biblical temple is not only theologically in error, it's also ironic. In light of the overwhelming testimony of the Old Testament scripture, the temple is, if anything, a Jewish reality. Given the dispensational differentiation between Jews and the Gentiles, and the saving works of God, it ought to be the Jews who constitute the temple, not Gentile believers. And if, in fact, it is largely a Gentile church that, in reality, that is the reality of the temple of the Old Testament in Israel, the oneness of the Old and New Testament believers scares the dispensationalists straight in the face. Well, we turn from that to Thamelios and soteriology in John. And this is a pretty solid, sound, full, compact article that teems with detail. John makes no direction, just mention of the sin offering. He's, been, he's talking about Jesus as the lamb. Yet although John does not link sin and death as overtly as Paul in Romans 6, 21 to 23, disobedience and death are linked. It is characteristic of this gospel, however, that the emphasis in the passage 6, 51 to 54 falls not on Christ's death for sin, but on his death for life. The gospel is about life, which is in the blood, Leviticus 17, 11. And in the shedding of blood, atonement is made and given. John reiterates this link between blood and death life. To drink Jesus' blood is to have eternal life. It creates a new identity, a shared life. For the participants are united with Jesus and Jesus with them. Participation in the death of Christ on the cross in which he gives his life for the life of the world brings life. As in the Levitical offerings, the death of one being, there an animal, here Jesus substitutes its life for another. Yet for life to be given, sin and death must be dealt with which is what in the drama the life vicariously does. Believing replaces the sin of unbelief, leading to life overcoming death. In short, John symbolically tells us that Jesus engages in substitutionary atonement, repeated by the author of 1 John 3.16, and although John does not provide the detailed mechanism by which this act accomplishes salvation, his emphasis falls on the underlying feature that ironically brings death. Ironically, death brings life. As Turner notes in the baptizer in 129-34, the first witness to Jesus, and so like the prologue, the one above all, through which the rest of John is inevitably to be read. Turn to the fifth metaphor, if you will. The shepherd, the good shepherd who brings life. The sheep motif returns in conjunction with an emphasis upon the shepherd of the sheep. Jesus' death again comes into view in his discourses of the good shepherd 
10, 11 to 18. He invests in his sheep, whether in his pen or outside, so that they know him and his voice and willingly follow him. 10, 3 through 14. Contrary to the hired hand who tends but does not own the sheep, the good shepherd looks to the benefit and voluntarily risks his life for his sheep. Quote, no one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. 1017. It is not a matter of necessity. Peter would disagree with that. Acts 223. But a free act of obedience that becomes a reason why the Father loves him. It is not that the Father would not have loved the Son had he not willingly died. John does not mean that the Father loved Christ because the crucifixion, crucifixion took place. However, the love of the Father for the Son is a love that is eternally linked with and mutually dependent upon the Son's complete alignment with the Father's will and his obedience even to death. Jesus does not seek to escape his death, but willing it willingly absorbs it as a part of his mission, 1227 and 28. We turn now to Thamelios, the next edition of it. And I believe we're doing book reviews heretofore. Three proposals. Oh, this is on an article on the pastor as a scholar pastor. Three proposals. So what does it look like for a pastor to edify God's people? With careful Christ-centered expositions of the whole counsel of God. In my view, the pastor as biblical theologian shares the presuppositions of the apostles cultivates personal and corporate practices for whole Bible intake and embraces the glorious purpose of magnifying Christ in all areas of life. Presuppositions, practices, and purpose. The three Ps for those readers who appreciate literation. Share the apostles' presuppositions. First, the pastor as a biblical theologian shares the apostles' presuppositions about the authority, unity, and fulfillment of scriptures. The first Christians devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, which has served as the doctrinal bedrock of the church in every generation and in every place. But there's a long-standing debate about whether believers today can and should follow the apostles' presuppositions and practices as well as their conclusions. Some scholars are cautious, citing the apostles' unique revelatory stance and their use of Jewish exegetical practices that were appropriate to explain the gospel for the first century audience, but not for contemporary readers. Thus, Richard Longnecker contends that unless we are restorationists in our attitude toward hermeneutics, Christians today are committed to the apostolic faith and doctrine of the New Testament, but not necessarily the apostolic exegetical methods as detailed for us in the New Testament. Others contend that following the apostles' authoritative teaching entails embracing the hermeneutics and presuppositions about the unity of the scriptures and the centrality of Christ salvation history. Thus G.K. Beale re reasons that while we cannot replicate the biblical author's inspired certainty, their interpretive practices remain viable for all saints to employ today. The task of biblical theology, according to Hamilton, is to recognize the biblical author's interpretive perspective as both normative and valid and then embrace it for ourselves 
In this regard, I find the Lord's climactic exposition in the scriptures of Luke 24, 44 to 47 to be incredibly important as a model and guide for believers. I unpack this after later. Now turn to the Journal for Biblical and Theological Studies for an empty article by an Orthodox layman on Catholicity. Basically, he is saying that it's good to be in an Orthodox context, but Christ may have his people outside that. That's the basic thrust. What are the theological and philosophical parameters for Catholicity? I mean, it's notable that there's not any exegesis, church history, or systematics going on. This uncertainty at the edges of Catholicity is theologically necessary. God is a person and can do as he pleases. God is only limited by his nature and his will. He has the power to do as he wills. The faithful know that God will not do evil. And so we will see consistency over the centuries in the commands and in truth. He is revealed to humankind most fundamentally in the person of Christ. The church is found where Christ is found, in a gathering of humans, visible and invisible. The marks of that church are right belief and practice leading to theosis. Normatively, one will see a bishop leading the people Godward, as the apostles did. The people of God are known by their bishop and the Orthodox bishop by their people. A worthy bishop is generally known by the fruit of his ministry to the faithful. This church is perfect and cannot die because of the inclusion of the living and dead as members. The saints are with the living faithful, praying for us, leading us by their examples. The Orthodox Church will be known through the ability to produce saints and if circumstance warrants martyrs. A reasonable expectation based on the character of God is that the Orthodox Church may understand theological and ethical truths more deeply, but not in a manner inconsistent with the thrust of the, our Father's Council's scripture and the totality of sacred tradition. Ideas related to the nature of Christ, for example, will develop, develop precision over time. Implications of these ideas, such as the use of icons in worship after the incarnation, will be grasped and introduced to the faithful. The liturgical practices of an Orthodox Church would show steady development that is organic with the growth and life of the church. We turn to Reformed Presbyterian Theological Journal of 1837 with an article on Romans 13 and a discussion of governments, moral and immoral. And he comments on how this has been twisted. The official designation of the civil ruler does not intimate that he is an ecclesiastical officer or that by his office he may exercise rule in the church or govern in ecclesiastical affairs. But it imports that as rulers in the house of God derive their authority from God, so the magistrate is appointed of God to the station he occupies, is clothed with God's authority and derives from him all his legitimate power. Indeed, all right to govern any of Jehovah's moral subjects must be derived from himself, otherwise it is usurpation. All men are creatures, the property, the subjects of Jehovah, their supreme Lord, and no one may presume to govern them without authority from his and their absolute sovereign. Hence, the power of which the apostle here treats is a ministry derived from God, and he who administers it is the deacon, servant, or minister of the Lord, 
the title by which one is it designated here is analogous to that by which the judges are called. Exodus 21.8, then his master shall bring him to the judges, literally to the gods. They receive this most honorable appellation because the judgment in which they are employed is God's judgment, Deuteronomy 1.7. So they are styled in 97.7, worship him all ye gods, angels, and civil rulers. And Psalm 82.6, I said you are gods, John 10.34. Is it not written in your law, I said you are gods? Such titles could not have been given by inspiration to the magistrate, were he not armed with all his moral authority from God. It would not have been necessary to dwell so long on this point, which ought to be taken as an axiom in government, were it not the baleful prevalence of the modern infidel, infidel maximum, that the people are the ultimate for, fountain of all civil power, that rulers are not as such bound to subject themselves to God. Civil government is indeed styled the ordinance of man. 1 Peter 2.3 Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. This of course means every moral legitimate ordinance of man. For men ordain many wicked things as popery, Mohammedism, Brahmanism and despotism, which are not to be submitted to. Shall we obey God or man? Judge ye. It is called the ordinance of man because God conveys the authority through the people whose suffrages are necessary to the legitimate exercise of power. He who rules without this is a usurper and of course is not God's minister for God will not sanction usurpation. Again, it is from God, for the powers that be are ordained of God, verse one. The words here rendered are ordained possess great emphasis in this connection. Literally, the powers that be are set in order as an army. We turn now to Southwestern Theological Journal. As <clears throat> and we're talking about a book review here, Already Sanctified, A Theology of the Christian Life in Light of God's Completed Work by John, Don J. J. Payne. He's on Facebook, I think. Presbyterian, I think. <clears throat> no, it's a Baptist. It already sanctified a theology of the Christian life in light of God's completed work. Don Payne, Associate Professor of Theology and Christian Formation at Denver Seminary, seeks to rescue the doctrine of sanctification. He makes the argument that positional sanctification, as it has been termed within theological discussions, bears much more weight on the Christian life than previous discussions have allowed. I think Professor John Murray at Westminster was advocating something of that. The impetus for this book arises from years of both pastoral ministry and teaching within a seminary context. Specifically, Payne argues that the present and future aspects of sanctification can properly be understood only in light of what has already been accomplished. The short text teases out the idea in biblical and practical perspective and serves as a helpful corrective, even if there might be some areas left unresolved in the debate. Chapters 1 and 2 provide a brief history of the Reformation conversation on sanctification as it arose in contrast to medieval Roman Catholicism. Here, Payne specifically looks at two reformers, Martin Luther and John Calvin. 
drawing conclusions from their thought on sanctification and justification as they relate one to another. Chapter 2 traces the line of thought a little further into later traditions such as Wesleyanism and the later Keswick movement, two movements highly influential within evangelicalism. Paine could have said more on the history of sanctification within Protestant Reformation, the pietistic tradition within Lutheranism that arose soon after the Reformation is important here. And other reformed inheritors of Calvin's thought within Europe and the British Isles are also important to consider. I believe it would have been helpful to give readers additional coordinates to locate this discussion more historically, especially as it relates to evangelicalism. Relying on authoritative sources such as Richard Lovelace, he was at Westminster, might have been useful to elaborate this more for the sake of providing further context and background to the issue at hand. I question his conclusion that Westminster and its language of further sanctified really and personally should be considered a sliding scale. What the Westminster divines and other Calvinistic teachers would have called this would-be holiness, piety, or experiential theology. What was considered personal sanctification would have been subsumed into a facet of election and regeneration, which was no less important a discussion, even if they moved on to the experience in holy living. Payne asserts that the confusion that results from a psychologically subtle interface between trusting God and just the right manner and engaging the right type of disciplines. This is a helpful observation and sets up the rest of Payne's argument and work through the text that he presents. And then for our last edition here, we're looking at Princeton Theological Review, 18, May 1838, I believe. It's certainly back in the days of Archibald Alexander, and they're doing a book review on the early letters of Melanchthon, tracing Melanchthon's developments. We really enjoy when they do book reviews. Woolsey, he says, would have found no fault with Luther if he had not denied the primacy of the Pope to be jured vino. So much did such men care for dignities and powers than for doctrines such as Wolsey. Erasmus then goes on to say, those who favor Luther, and indeed all good men favor him, could wish that he had written with more mildness and civility. Yeah, go ahead, Erasmus, you flatterer and sycophant. Luther had a target on his back and would have been burned at the stake while you waffled and gabble-fested. But it is too late now to talk of that. I see that the affair tends now to revolution. This is Erasmus on Luther. I pray that it may turn out to the glory of Christ. Now you get your paycheck and your patrons, Erasmus. He could be bloody and merciless when he needed me, and then when he needed a patron for some money, he was the biggest sycophant around. I have very little use for Erasmus other than his textual work in the Latin. Plus, he was a semi-Pelagian at best. Died in Basel in 1536. I pray that it may turn out to the glory of Christ. It is necessary, perhaps, that offenses should come, but I do not care to be the man by whom they come. Well, yeah, you're getting your paycheck. The last sentence is itself a striking portrait of Erasmus. In the postscript, there's another characteristic trait. 
Luther's reply to the condemnation of his books by certain doctors of Louvain and Cologne has given great satisfaction. Those men at last begin to be ashamed of their premature decision. I am only sorry that my name was mentioned. It hurts me without assisting Luther. Close quote. It is curious to compare this mild and courteous complaint with the sentence which occasioned it. In the reply, Luther, after having named several others, adds, quote, I pass by Faber Stabulensis and Erasmus, that ram caught in the thicket by his horns, close quote. Every reader acquainted with the history of the times must be equally impressed with the felicity and truth of this uncivil metaphor and with the characteristic contrast and exhibited between the two great men. The spirit of Erasmus is displayed not only in the actual expressions of his letters, but in its obvious design as a complaint against Luther's rudeness and at the same time an attempt to cry for his mercy. No wonder that instead of a direct approach to Dr. Martin Luther, he preferred an indirect one through Master Philip Melanchthon, to whom we now return from this digression. We've already given an example of Melanchthon's modesty and judgment in relation to his labors as a teacher. We may now give an instance of his noble moderation as to Luther and his disinterested zeal in learning. Even from the time of his arrival in Wittenberg, Luther had urged an augmentation of Melanchthon's stipend to prevent his being drawn away from them to Leipzig. In compliance with these instances, Spallatin, it seems, had advised the professors to apply to the elector for an increase of salary for Melanchthon, no doubt with the assurance that it would be granted. In this measure, Melanchthon declines to acquiesce, briefly stating as his reason that his stipend was a large one in the actual state of German affairs, that it was large enough compared with those other professors and that he was unwilling to abuse the goodness of his patron, the elector. We'll call this edition part two of Theological Journals to a close with a prayer. Lighten our darkness, O Lord Jesus Christ, with the light of thy being. Walk with us around, under, over, behind, in front of, and in us, guiding our thoughts and our doings this day, that they may be righteous before that glorious tribunal in heaven. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Here ends this session. We're going to pick up with part three on Dr. Whitaker, Disputation on Holy Scripture, Bishop John Jewell's Apology of the Church of England, and also the Anti-Nicene Fathers, the ten-volume set. In a little while. Godspeed. Good to have you here.